Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us here on our final Conservation Cafe of this season. For those of you who are first-timers, of which there are many, welcome, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, these monthly talks, this Conservation Cafe series, run through the winter months and are put on by us here at the Thousand Islands Watershed Land Trust, which we call Quilt. Quilt is a non-governmental, non-profit registered charity devoted to helping uh, people protect ecologically sensitive land, ensuring that the natural value there is conserved forever. Since 1993, we've worked to conserve over 6,000 acres of land in this gorgeous and productive area, helping wildlife and people alike along the way. Quilt is honored to welcome Caleb Musgrave as tonight's speaker. Caleb is a Mississauga on a Schnabe man from Rice Lake. His extensive experience ranges from archaeological and ethnobotanical research to constructing birch bark canoes, to traveling to remote regions of the Americas to study the land skills and life ways of indigenous peoples. Caleb's work as a trainer has brought lessons of indigenous education, wilderness skills, and bushcraft to over 20,000 people, a number we can all count ourselves lucky to be a part of after tonight. Here, presenting Deep Roots, the history and future of our forests, please join me in welcoming Caleb Musgrave. Uh, me and miigwech for that. I really appreciate that opening. Uh, the introduction has been great. I also want to thank Calder, Rachel, Marnie, everyone involved at Twilt to help organize this. This was a very well put together for how quickly it came together uh, event. So thank you very much for all of your amazing work making this happen. Uh, and with the introduction done from Calder, thank you again. Thank you again for that. I don't feel like I have to talk too much about myself which ruins my narcissistic desires, but we'll move forward anyways. Uh, my background with the land is generational and cultural, and then coming from a perspective of trying to preserve and revitalize the future. Um, and to understand everything that we try to do with land trust, with conservation authorities, with parks across Canada and the United States and internationally and abroad and beyond, we need to look at our past. The, the roots of the tree start long before the leaves come up. Uh, and I know that for certain because I've got a bunch of little baby trees that I've been growing from seed for the last several months. And not a lot is happening on the surface right now. I got a couple little leaves here and there, but there's giant roots coming down. And so the title of tonight's Conservation Cafe is really good for that. It's explaining the same kind of analogy of what I'm trying to get across when it comes down to knowing what we're going to do with our forests to benefit them to benefit the future we got to look at the past and the past is big the past is really really broad you know when we think about just humans on in north america and i have just humans around the world actually let's go that far let's talk about humans and hominids going back 3.1 million years arguably depending on how far you want to go back in africa that's a drop in the bucket to the eons and eons and epochs that have happened before and after uh we are but a tick on the butt of a polar bear standing on the tip of an iceberg when it comes down to the heritage and the natural history of this landscape. And with that being said, let's get into it. Let's talk about all the things there is to talk about regarding the land. Let's talk about the past starting and that gets us up to the present and then we'll talk a little bit about the future. So the past goes back a long time, as I already said. If we want to really talk about Ontario history, and that's really the only way that we can really dive deep into all of our histories, to start at the beginning of Ontario. Going back, you know, millions of eons, we don't have a lot of information for the last mm, 400 million years until about 3 million years ago. And this is because of glacial activity in the last 3 million years. So when we look way back, people all the time are going out to Alberta and Montana to find dinosaur fossils. And I've had people say, well, there's no dinosaurs in Ontario. There's never dinosaurs here. There were, but we're guessing what was here because we don't have much evidence because of the glaciers. When we talk about the Mesozoic, which is the time of the dinosaurs, the time before the dinosaurs, having archaeosaurs, the time after the dinosaurs, which is the, when the time of birds and mammals really swarmed up to the surface and all this amazing growth on land. We don't have a lot of that in information here in Ontario. The rocks that do hold fossils are limestone and a few other stone formations here in Ontario. 
mostly limestone and where we what we find there are aquatic life that are from 450 million years ago and beyond so animals like brachiopods animals like ammonites to, to a degree not as many out here because again they're a little later uh, a little earlier i guess later it's hard to tell when we talk about distance of time but anyways ammonites are a little bit more recent so we do occasionally find them in Ontario, but nowhere close to as many as what you see over in the United Kingdom and in Western United States and Canada. But corals, crinoids, brachiopods, all these different creatures are on the surface. And then we get up to the Canadian Shield, and there's not much information up there on the fossil record because granite doesn't hold fossils. Granite is a rock that was formed by volcanic activity, and nothing survives volcanic activity. So it would be broken down to its base elements and turned into more magma or lava, depending on where it is on the surface or below the crust. So most of our uh, of our paleontological history is wiped from the face of the earth, literally and figuratively, because of the ice sheets, because of the uh, the glaciers. And so when we're talking about the glaciers, we got to think about all that time that they were here. They did some massive damage. They they carved up everything from the soft rock and the soils. They actually burnished many of the mountain ranges close to us. So including the Rockies, not as much the Rockies because the Rockies were quite tall, but Adirondacks, the Appalachian Mountains, the Laurentide Mountains that are the ones that come up technically Appalachian all the way up to the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, we see this massive burnishing and scouring of the land like a giant just bulldozer followed by a bunch of you know scrubbies just cleaning everything up behind it. When we What we do find is drumlins uh, showing us the evidence of when those glaciers receded back. And those drumlins are just giant gravel piles, kind of like what you see when you're sweeping your floor with a dustpan. You always have that little line of dirt that doesn't ever go away. Like you can sweep and sweep and sweep, and that little pile of dirt is right there, dust or cat dander, whatever it may be. That's kind of what the drumlins are. And we have quite a few of those here in Ontario. Where I live, there's approximately... I think it's like one, uh, I think it's about one out of four uh, hills in the Peterborough area are actually drumlins. So over a quarter of our hillsides and our hilltops around here are drumlins, especially if they're going east-west because they're being pushed by the glacier south and then as it receded north, being left behind with an east-west formation. <laughs> and so talking about this geological history and ancestry to understand what this landscape looked like it's anyone's guess. We really don't have a comprehensive breakdown of what North America, especially Ontario and most of Canada, would have looked like before the glaciers. It's really, really hard. And so it's anyone's guess, really. Going beyond the glaciers, we start getting into that time of recession. So the length of the time of glaciation goes back, I believe, two hundred uh, two and a half million years to about arguably 11,000 years ago. So you're having multiple glacier, glaciation periods coming through, stamping, moving things around as they want. And this is called the quaternary glaciation. And it also is pretty much the entirety of what we refer to in nature and in paleontology as the Pleistocene Epoch, at least in North America. The Pleistocene Epoch being the time of the megafaun, when you're seeing mastodons and mammoths and glyptodons and saber-toothed cats and all these amazing animals that are just not here anymore. That time was the Pleistocene Epoch. And so as we get to those glaciers receding back, we got to remember how big they really were. They were massive. In many parts of North America, they were up to four to five kilometers thick on some occasions. In Ontario, I believe the thickest were up in northern Ontario towards the Hudson Bay region. Uh, but in eastern Ontario, where the Thousand Islands watershed is, it was about two kilometers thick. And that's just a number that's hard to, to comprehend in my eyes. It's really, really challenging to comprehend two kilometers higher than where I'm sitting right now. That's just, that's an absurd concept. That's where planes are. <laughs> that's not where, where ice is supposed to be in my head. It just blows my mind every time I start thinking about it. And on the edge of the glaciers, wherever it may be, whether it was on the southern edge, the eastern edge of the glaciers, wherever it was still somewhat warm. And I, and I want to use that word very carefully somewhat warm the somewhat being the key word there we have this environment called the paraglacial area these are the spaces near the glacier that aren't necessarily under ice yet or ha or were at one point uh, and these are going to be uh, permafrost kind of like what we see up in the canadian tundra now and on that permafrost the first little bit of active soil on the surface you would have plants growing on them and that's something people don't really understand is how 
many plants can actually survive because they evolved in this climate for so long to not necessarily just survive, but thrive in those extreme cold, dry climates near a glacier. You're going to have things like grasses, some forbs, certain trees, little tiny shrubby trees. Uh, currently, the Canadian Arctic has over 1,700 species of plants, and that's not even including the aquatic ones. That's just the plants, the terrestrial plants. And many of them at this time, in the time period of the glaciers, 2.5 million to 11,000 years ago, were where we are now. That that's a that's a thought that just always amazes me is how these plants were able to effectively walk behind that glacier as it receded back into the north. So, and we know this because we do have some fossils and we have pollen samples from lake bottoms, from drumlins and beyond, showing what plants were down here 2.5 million years to 11,000 years ago during the Pleistocene. Getting beyond the paraglacial, we start getting into these lake systems that were being formed during the glaciation and after the glaciation. At the time of the glacial sheet, the which is the Laurentide ice sheet, the Thousand Islands region was still under ice. And that was actually preventing a lot of water from other regions from escaping. This formed the glacial lake Iroquois approximately 13,000 years ago, over top what's now Lake Ontario and the western end, the 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 river, the uh the water source of the St. Lawrence. It shut pretty much everything else down because that ice that was over where you folks are. And that made this lake get big, like huge. All of Toronto was under sea or underwater. All of, you know, Syracuse, New York, Rochester, New York, Buffalo, New York, they were, they were submerged. They were submerged by quite a few hundred feet of water in certain places. And that creates what comes later now north of the lake iroquois glacial lake iroquois we had lake ojibwe which was connected to another small lake small being kind of a hilarious thing to say uh large lake uh lake Ag acasis i believe is how to say it or acasis and these went across northern ontario just south of james bay up into manitoba and they also bled down towards the saint lawrence and so we have that up there. We have Lake Iroquois down where Toronto is. <clears throat> and Lake Ojibwe was around 8,500 years ago. West of where every all this activity is happening, we have Lake Algonquin. Glacial Lake Algonquin was, <laughs> like, this was the biggest lake to ever lake. <laughs> we have Lake Superior, Lake Huron, I think Georgian Bay, Lake Michigan, Lake Simcoe, Nipigon, Nipissing, Pretty much every body of water that, the, that is the Muskokas and northern Lake Superior shoreline all the way down into Michigan was Lake Algonquin, Glacial Lake Algonquin. At its maximum, it was about 12,000 years old. Uh, and then going to 10,000 years ago, it started to recede and drain its water. Uh, this massive yield of water in here eventually broke through, started draining from the French River all the way down to the Ottawa River connecting to the St. Lawrence. And that explains where all this water came from that then carved out the St. Lawrence. As temperatures around the world, I'm starting to read the, my own slideshow and I said I wouldn't. <laughs> as temperatures around the world rose, the glaciers receded. Plains and valleys that were ironed out and carved out by the glaciers started to form and they were starting to have much more grasses coming up, more of the cold weather grasses we were talking about earlier with the uh, paraglacial area start to spread out into what we refer to as plains or steps, depending on the, uh, the topography. But a lot of those valleys start filling with meltwater. Those valleys are often called kettle valleys, which are basically wherever there was some soft rock in the ground rock, in the, in the bedrock, carved out and then filled up with meltwater. These, these became rivers and lakes that were huge, massive bodies of water, effectively what is the ancestry of Lake Ojibwe, Lake Algonquin, and Lake Iroquois. Grasses and other prairie species took over the landscape, offering food to the Pleistocene megafauna, as we were talking about earlier. Mastodons, which were an American type of mammoth. We also had woolly mammoth here, but the mastodon was an American specific species that was in North and South America for an extent of time. Castoroides, which is the giant beaver, one of my favorite animals. I, if every chance I get to talk about a Castoroides, I take the chance to talk about a Castoroides. These were massive, mostly ground dwelling mammals uh, that were cutting down trees and building dams and doing that for the most part as 
a landscape creator, just like we have now with the modern American beaver, Canadian beaver. Giant short-faced bear, which was the largest land carnivore to ever carnivore. They were massive, uh, incredibly large animals. And we now believe that they were a super scavenger and basically were a parasitic carnivore that would chase off animals just by their sheer size from those animals killed. So dire wolves, gray wolves, American lions, American puma, American saber-toothed cats were getting scared off their kills by this giant bear that could walk for miles from how long its legs were. And they were actually decent at running, just not turning and being able to use a lot of power when they ran and caught their prey. But if they did fight, man, were they powerful. Their jaw bones were built like a pit bull or a Rottweiler. And the weirdest one of them all that I love to add to any list is the giant pika, which is like this rabbit leg animal. But the pikas that we now know are up in the Himalayas and much of Asia and a little bit of the Andes, I do believe. Uh, their closest relatives being the guinea pigs of the Andes. And here they are being giant animals that are about the size of a raccoon to the size of a modern jackrabbit in Ontario. These animals were wandering through Ontario in these great plains that we had here, the grasslands that we had at that time. We're talking about 11,000, 12,000, about 8,000 years ago, we had this landscape. Now, as the water started to recede down into the St. Lawrence River system, the watershed of the Thousand Islands, all that water draining away and the glaciers getting further and further north, we started seeing what we now refer to as boreal and subalpine tree species. We start seeing the forests coming in and you're going to see things like pine, spruce, balsam fir, further west, other tree species like the Douglas fir and the redwoods start to move up from California and start to take over the, uh, the British Columbian coastline. Here in Ontario, it started off with boreal trees and subalpine trees. And then as the planet got warmer and wetter, instead of just cool and dry during the grassland periods, we start seeing trees forming here that were further south originally, sugar maples, hickories, and basswoods, and many, many other trees. And I'm a dendrophile. I love trees. I love talking about trees. And this is where my favorite time period begins, although it's a very sad time period elsewhere and beyond just the trees showing up. And that's because we start having die-off happen. With the prairies and the subarctic plants and shrubs moving deep into the north and drying up in this area, well, wetting up because the plant life that came in came with humidity and moisture and warmth, we have a problem. Megafauna cannot move through deep forests. They need to live on the steppes and plains. The last remaining bastion of megafauna in the Americas was the Great Plains of North America. And that's because they had a stronghold there. They still had grasslands to live on. They didn't have to try and move through deep forest as much as they had to here in Ontario. But there was a second variable in there, another factor. And that was humans moving through the area. Now, when humans arrived is a still up for debate. We know the Bering Land Strait or the Bering Land Bridge hypothesis has been confirmed into a theory. And we know that a certain number of people came over. But we also know there's a lot of other people that were possibly here prior to that but they were being kept out of this region because of the glaciation. So we lose the megafauna both to climate change and human interaction with them. Of course, that interaction being hunting. As the waters held back by the ice broke loose, massive waterways were formed, including the Champlain Sea, which we'll be talking about in a moment, because it is what was over top of present day Thousand Islands watershed. This aquatic, uh, this wet water world was home to many aquatic mammals and fish, including seals, walrus, belugas, and so many more. All these animals that we consider to be animals of the Arctic Ocean and the cold North Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic coastline, sometimes all the way into the, the beginning of the St. Lawrence, they were all the way up into Trenton, Ontario, Smith Falls. They were all the way up in here when they were in the Champlain Sea. And these animals became the food source of early contact, early uh, settling nations of the, of the coastlines of the Champlain Sea being the ancestors of the modern day Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabek, Mashkegawak, possibly even Inuit people or Proto-Inuit people who are coming down along the edges of the glacier to get down this way to get to food. So as the megafauna went away, indigenous people moved to the waters to find these large water animals, these large aquatic sea mammals 
to be their food source. And as those sea mammals began to leave, as the Champlain Sea started to close up, we moved to fish. And that gets us into the more recent times of what's referred to sometimes as the end of the, of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Anthropocene, all the way into what's referred to as the Archaic Period. <clears throat> now, the Champlain Sea was huge. The Champlain Sea is it makes the St. Lawrence like this like quick one hour drive from Lake Ontario and up uh, up into Frontenac and then bam, you're in the Champlain Sea. So you have this massive body of water. Uh, and as the glaciers continue to recede, this water began to dry up, not because there was less water, but because of this cool reaction that happens with the ground called isostatic rebound which is basically all that ground that's been compressed for over a million years, two million years, two and a half million years by the glaciers when that weight came off. Because again, we're talking two kilometer thick ice. As soon as that starts to move back, some of that ground starts to bounce back up. It starts to become almost elastic and want to return to where it was before. And as the ground lifted into the air, the water drained further down and the Champlain Sea began to recede. And we started to lose those big, aquatic sea mammals and then we start getting into the time that we refer to as the archaic period indigenous peoples start to look towards fishing they start to look towards smaller games such as the white-tailed deer uh, bison who were up towards ontario not necessarily in ontario but towards ontario by that point and as those other big foods that were so easily dependent on one man one mastodon could feed a community of people for a long time with those animals gone, with the sea mammals that can also feed because they're so big, belugas are not a small animal, neither is a walrus. They can feed communities for a decent amount of time, especially if you have very good success at hunting them when they're in groups. You start coming into the desire to figure out other ways to take care of your people, fishing and small game hunting, and eventually agriculture. So by the end of the archaic period, which is approximately 8,000 to 3,000 years ago, we start seeing the complexity of society forming in the Americas. So in the Great Lakes region and the watershed that is the Thousand Islands, you're seeing indigenous peoples forming complex societies amongst themselves. The Haudenosaunee, six, uh, well, originally Five Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabek <clears throat> political systems and clan systems that were forming, the formation of copper working technology. So uh, indigenous people in North America, especially around the Great Lakes region, were working copper long before contact with Europeans. Uh, we're talking possibly upwards of 7,000 years back into that archaic period. And as the water recedes, as the glaciers recede, as the land rises back up, and we have to start resorting to different ways of getting food, and we start developing agriculture, we start getting complex societies, complex political systems, complex uh, spiritual practices, complex languages, <clears throat> as well as the ability to work metal. And that brings us into agriculture. So this photo is not actually from Ontario. This photo is from one of the most beautiful places I've ever learned about in North America. And this is what much of Eastern North America looked like in this time period known as the Woodland Period. This is Turkey Run, Indiana, Turkey Run State Park. And it is one of the last bastions of what this time period looked like in North America. As we developed all these complex systems, our agricultural systems became very, very uh, unique, very, very, um, trying to think of the most beautiful way to explain it. Complex is, almost, is, an, is ironically an oversimplification of what it was. We have this massive, long-term, big plan, multi-generational agriculture system that is now anthropologically known as the Eastern Agricultural Complex. This is when squashes, beans, sunflowers, and a large portion of traditional foods that are indigenous foods of the Americas first started to get domesticated. This is also when we start seeing things like Turkey Run Indiana being developed. And that is the purposeful planting of tree species by indigenous people, which is something that has only been really noticed in the last few decades. So the end of the Eastern agricultural complex was when mandamin or maize or corn was introduced into the Eastern woodlands from Mexico. Many of the previously domesticated foods were then abandoned. They were not important anymore because it took a lot of work to maintain them. It took a lot of work to grow them up and get them to make nice big juicy seeds that we can make into grains, uh, well, pseudo cereal grains at least. A good example of that is the goosefoot plant. 
Uh, Goosefoot is also known as lamb's quarters. During the Eastern Agricultural Complex, this was a massive food source. Uh, this is a relative of quinoa, amaranth, uh, chia, and many other plant, uh, plant foods that are from the Americas. This was the northernmost variety being grown in these regions. Uh, but when we stopped growing it, as a food source, those seeds began to revert back to wild. They went feral and they went back to being small little plants. Nowadays, we look at them as a weed in our gardens. My ancestors looked at this plant as a food source that was very important and depended on heavily before corn came along. So the Eastern uh, the groundwork of the Eastern Agricultural Complex remains to this day. Uh, it, it's still around in places like Turkey Run, <clears throat> Turkey Run State Park in Indiana uh, in the form of forests that covered the eastern woodlands. And that's where we start getting into contact. So trees and shrubs such as butternut, uh, American chestnut, black currants, wild plums, per, uh, American persimmons, all these different kinds of edible fruits, whether they're nut producing, fruit producing, berry producing, or they had flowers or they had bark that were edible, We've now confirmed through soil testing, through DNA testing of the plants themselves, uh, figuring out their genotypes and everything else like that. We now know that the vast majority of these trees were either propagated and planted or imported and planted by indigenous people. Uh, there's now a belief that all old growth butternuts in the state of New York were planted by the Haudenosaunee people, all of them. That it's not like the like you know the vast majority or. The, the the very strong majority, it was all of them. All butternuts in the state of New York that were old growth butternuts came from the Haudenosaunee, importing them from Virginia, North Carolina, and many other places. And this is the case across the board with many of our tree species that are hardwood deciduous trees that produce foods. Again, persimmons, walnuts, hazelnuts, all these Ameri amazing foods. When Verrazano first arrived in the Americas, he described the Eastern woodlands as this park-like, Eden-like estate <clears throat> that was given to the settlers by God. It is Eden. They found the Garden of Eden. No, we built it. Anishinaabek people built it. Leni Lenape people built it. Haudenosaunee people built it. All these indigenous peoples across the Eastern seaboard into the, all the way to the Mississippi built this system. And it still works today where it has not been devastated or deforested. It still works. Turkey Run State Park is still a massive, what is now referred to as a food forest that dates back 1,500 plus years, and the system is still functioning. And that's what we really need to understand about the forests of this region, of our regions where we live. These forests before European contact, before contact with settlers and explorers, was a massive food system that was built by the hands and the minds of indigenous people thinking forward because anyone here that know uh, anyone here that's grown nut trees and fruit trees knows that it's very difficult to get a instant return on that investment there's a, a an old quote an old saying uh, and uh, credo and uh, proverb from Europe that a wise person plants a tree that they know they will never enjoy the shade from and that is what my ancestors, my indigenous ancestors were doing here, planting these trees for future generations to be able to profit from, to be able to benefit from, to be able to thrive because of. We don't have words really in our language talking about <clears throat> hunger and famine in the same way that you see in the Middle East, in the Middle Eastern languages, in Roman languages, Greek languages, because we had so many varieties of food easily at our disposal that we didn't have to fear that. When the deforestation began in the 14, 15, 1600s and all the way into the 1900s, that's when we see these terms of bakaday and hunger coming along. Now, it wasn't just trees. Plants such as sunchokes were also propagated and spread throughout the landscape as long-term food systems. We actually don't know for sure where sunchokes originate. We know they originated somewhere in North America. But we don't know where exactly, because as soon as indigenous peoples realized that it had these massive tubers, that's one tuber that's in my hand. One. Uh, I have a garden of these in my home on my homestead where I have not watered them, fertilized them, irrigated them in any way. I haven't taken care of these plants whatsoever in the 12 years that I've grown them. Every once in a while, I'll chop down the old winter stalks and let them be like a mulch and eventually a fertilizer for the plants below but I'm still pulling out about 10 to 15 pounds per square foot. 
out of that garden without any work. These systems today are often called food forests or permaculture. <clears throat> and the kicker is Western, uh, Western agricultural and Western culture and science has only been catching up to this in since the 60s. And even then, it hasn't really picked up steam until the last 15, 20 years that we start seeing the devastation of Western-style agriculture on the land. All the while, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples have been using this system for thousands of generations. So that's my major talk about getting us to this point. That's the, the major part is that our landscape is vast and diverse. It is Anishinaabe, Joaquin, Anishinaabe territory spans from the Western Great Lakes and the Mississippi River all the way to the central St. Lawrence River system. Uh, and it is massive. There's a lot of different ecosystems in there. And we have a relationship with all of it as Anishinaabe people. The photo on the left is from Kitchener-Waterloo area just the other day when I was down there. And there's amazing amounts of hardwood in there that you don't see where I live. <clears throat> the photos on the right are from the southern edge of the boreal forest on the top right photo. The bottom uh, right photo is the woods around my camp at dawn when I was out deer hunting this past fall. The photo in the middle is my friend and I out in a canoe harvesting manolmen, wild rice. And you can see the variety of life in these, in these ecosystems. The variety of trees that are in these ecosystems are vast. And we have an intimate relationship with every single one of these species. Even to an extent, the non-native plants that are on this landscape as well now. And so I want to go through some of what we have a relationship with so we understand where the future can go. Iska gamizagan is our word for sugar bush. Uh, Iska, Iska gamizagan is talking about where we get zinsabakwat, maple sugar. Zinsabakwat is one of the only sweeteners that indigenous people had in this port, part of the world. Whether it was the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Abenaki, the Maliseet, wherever they were, where there was sugar maples, or at least a variety or species of maple, we were boiling it down to get sugar. Now, in this photo on the left, of course, these are photos, uh, This these are cauldrons at my current sugar bush, where I sugar, we use cast iron cauldrons and occasionally clay pots, but we also use birch bark baskets and modern uh, buckets to catch our sap. We use traditional cedar spiles to tap the trees, as well as modern steel spiles to tap the trees. We try to bring and integrate as much as we can into our sugar bush. We tap mostly red maple, a little bit of sugar maple. We also tap hickories, walnuts, yellow birch, white birch to get saps from them as well, all in the same forest. It's a, it's a beautiful place and it's a huge, important part of our identity as Indigenous peoples. Anishinaabek, our new year, is what we call Ziguan. Ziguan is the beginning of the sugaring season when the sap starts to rise up into the trees when we have very cold nights and very warm days. Usually that's, you know, right now. This year, that was the beginning of, beginning of February possibly even earlier, because we're dealing with anthropogenic climate change. Things are changing drastically on the landscape, very drastically. And so we got to take that into consideration as Indigenous people of what's going on, because all of our indicators that we usually follow to get to the sugaring period of the time of year, Ziguan, failed us. I was waiting for the crows to come in large numbers, as they usually do, before we can harvest our sap. And when I got out there, I found out I was almost a month late because the crows were also confused by everything that's been going on. Part of that's from El Nino effect, but also from anthropogenic climate change. And so it's affecting our sugar bushes, which is a major, major part of our cultural identity, our cultural food systems, and our food security. Wigwas, not a food source, but a tool. Wigwas is birch bark. Uh, in these photos, there's uh, some friends of mine and I out harvesting what's referred to as winter bark. There's two <clears throat> basic types of birch bark off of a white birch or paper birch tree. Uh, you have the summer bark, which is during the growing period of the tree's life, and the winter bark, which is during the dormant period of the tree's life. If you gather winter bark, which takes a little bit extra work because you got to warm the bark up as you peel it off the tree, uh, you can do it alive or dead. You, gotta, you just want to make sure if, you, if it's dead that you're the one that cut it down because after just a few weeks on the ground, birch bark degrades rapidly. Uh, you can't use dead bark 
from a dead tree to make a basket. You can't, well, woven basket, yes, but not a folded bark basket. You can't use it to make birch bark canoes. You can't use it to make the cuffs that are in this photo. This is winter bark cuffs that I made for my son's regalia, for his powwow regalia. And so the winter bark, the flow and the inner bark attaches and adheres to the inside of the outer bark, leaving these dark brownish colors in that right-hand photo. And all I got to do when I peel the bark off is let it get exposed to the sun for a couple of days. It gets nice and dark. If it doesn't get dark enough, I can take some tea or coffee and rub it on. And I'm going to do that anyways because I'm going to use warm liquid and a sharp tool. In the photo, I have an awl and a pocket knife. And I use those to scratch away the phloem while it's nice and damp from the hot tea or hot coffee. And scrape away and leave these beautiful designs all over the bark. And that's called bark etching or winter bark etching. So this relationship we have both in the summertime and in the wintertime with birch, people often complain about peeling live birch trees. <clears throat> They'll yell, you're killing the tree. If I cut through the inner bark, the cambium, yes. And I'm not going to deny that we harm the tree when we do this. This does harm the tree. It's like me peeling your epidermis off your skin. It's going to hurt you. But unlike your epidermis, the birch tree has evolved for 49 million years. In a northern landscape, in a cold landscape, the birch species has been evolving and growing and changing and adapting to the climate around it. And when it has, when you have a deciduous tree that has thin bark, that tree needs to have some fail-safe options to protect itself. And for one example is the fact that because it has thin bark compared to something like a maple or a hickory or an oak, that inner, that outer bark can easily get damaged, whether it be from, you know, a human being peeling the bark off or from a tree landing against and scraping and tearing the bark, or a mammal like a squirrel, a moose, or a beaver chewing at that outer bark. The inner bark can still protect the tree. Many, many, I'd say 98% of the trees that I've peeled in my lifetime alive are still alive. 98%. The other 2% from what I noticed when I observed what killed them, it looked like storms mostly killed them, and they would have died whether they had their outer bark on or not. So this is a sustainable method of harvesting bark as an indigenous person. We have this within our treaty rights to continue doing so and practicing. This photo was just from a week ago. Uh, the photo on the left of me and my friends peeling birch. <clears throat> Wigwas was used for canoes, baskets, clothing, jewelry, even cradle boards to carry our babies in. Birch bark was the white birch is to Anishinaabeg people one of the most important trees that we have to know. Whether it's for fire lighting, like many people know when they go to Algonquin Park, you get a little piece of birch bark off the ground and that'll light like gasoline and get your kindling going. <clears throat> All the way to building Jimon, birch bark canoes. So it's a very important resource in our lives for everything from picking berries to carrying our babies to carrying our entire family or sheltering our family as bark lodge shingles. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this right now because I did not have enough uh coffee this morning choke cherries choke cherries were the predominant fruit source of northern hemisphere north america of the northern hemisphere of the northern regions of north america the boreal regions many people think it was blueberries blueberries were common but this fruit source was an important what well, the i would say the most important fruit to know if you're in northern ontario and even down where i live here in the peterborough region rice lake plains we have choke cherries this bucket is one gallon of berries, choke cherries, from one choke cherry bush. Growing in the wild, we didn't add fertilizer. We didn't do irrigation to it. This per, this wild tree, sm uh, this small tree, large shrub, produced these fruit on their own. And the photo on the right is part of our reciprocity with these beings. I'm rooting these cuttings to be able to spread more choke cherries in the woods to continue their diversity. There's uh, several different... Uh, cuttings from multiple different places across where I live so that the genetics can remain strong. So I'm not causing a genetic bottleneck by any means and make sure they can continue to propagate and thrive. Uh, the choke cherry is an important food source. It's also a very good tool wood for a lot of different things. A lot of my elders make pipe stems out of them, but also uh, devices and tools that we require for a lot of our ceremonies, including the rain dance or sun dance. So the choke cherry is another tree that we have a very intimate relationship with. Manomanake, harvesting wild rice. We, I live on, on Rice Lake. <laughs> rice Lake is named Rice Lake for a reason. Uh, at the early part of the 1900s, we were averaging 10,000 bushels of wild rice from Rice Lake alone, annually, sustainably. 
that 10,000 bushels adds to about 620,000 pounds. Over half a million pounds of wild rice was being harvested from canoe with ricing sticks, just two sticks that almost look like pool cues that are only an arm length, uh, the length of an arm, and two people going out and knocking those grains, which that hand that is there holding all those seeds, that's wild rice from one plant. I reached out, grabbed the plant, and just released the seeds into my palm and took that photo. So you can see how much food can be harvested from each single individual stock. Look at how much wild rice is in that photo. Look at how many plants are in that little wetland. That's only a five-minute drive from my house. That's what Rice Lake used to look like until the Trent Severn Waterway came along and flooded it all out. Manoman is one of the most important food sources to Anishinaabe people because of this reason of large volume of food. We saw Gimatiga Minish, Northern Red Oak. These acorns were harvested in less than five minutes. Those are the leaves, the second generation of leaves that summer, because that summer of 2021, I believe, was the summer of the spongy moth infestation in much of Southern Ontario. They defoliated all of our oaks and all of our young trees. Many of them died. I would say 40% of our red oaks and white oaks, seedlings and saplings died from the spongy moth infestation. Whereas these mature red oaks that are growing just above the, the top of the hill of my house, where my house is, they were able to put out a second generation of leaves before the end of the growing season, and they were able to survive. And this is one of the most important parts about conservation is making sure that mature trees are left on the landscape and that we have old growth ecosystem because these trees have the generational knowledge in their DNA of how to survive and how to resist against things such as spongy moth, such as emerald ash borer, such as the new diseases coming because we now have oak rust wilt in Ontario. It has been uh, has been diagnostically confirmed that it is in Ontario now and it hits red oaks harder than almost any other species. Keeping our old growth trees and our mature oaks and other pieces of trees on the land guarantees res guarantees resiliency in the future, whether, whether it's in the form of them themselves staying alive or them producing enough seeds to carry on the generations ahead of them. Black locust. This one is controversial in much of Ontario. Some people argue it's an invasive species. Others say it's a long lost relative because there's some evidence that the black locust may have been here before the glaciers. And of course, trees not having legs like we have take them a while to come back. I'm not denying that in the wrong contexts, this tree can be a harmful. It can affect prairie ecosystems. It can affect a lot of different kinds of woodlands because it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere in the soil because it's part of the legume family. It's a distant relative's peas and beans. And because of that, ecosystems that have evolved to not require a lot of nitrogen are now getting inundated with nitrogen, which encourages invasive species like purging buckthorn, garlic mustard, dog strangling vine, and many, many other species. So I'm not saying that this tree is innocent, but I'm also saying that there are some relations that we have with this tree. Those flowers are one of the early foods of the growing season the black locust blossoms are delicious absolutely delicious and they're not just delicious to us if you've ever had acacia honey in ontario you are consuming honey that is made from the nectar of the black locust in the picture on the right that is my sunchoke patch i was talking about earlier my drusum artichoke patch in in the background in the foreground that's a botagon or corn pounder uh flower mortar made of black locust. It is a very rot resistant wood and on the landscape and ecologically, it can help retain soil during erosion risks. So when we have these deep, deep river banks that are being completely defoliated and de deforested, we have major risks of erosion. Black locust can fill that niche and it can set out long rhizomal roots that help hold that soil really, really, really well. Uh, a large portion of my property is black locust and I work with them, not against them. I try to benefit myself and the ecology by having them where they are and working with them where they shouldn't be and working with those woods in the example of cutting one down to make corn pounders that last upwards of 100 years plus. Black locust is one of the most rot resistant woods in the world. Strong wood, flexible wood, makes good hunting bows. It makes good canoe paddles. It makes very good many, many, many things. It's a very good wood to work with uh, if you're into bushcraft or wood turning or carving. It's a beautiful wood to know. Tulip tree. This is a tree that I have a 
deep affinity for, and I wish there was more of them around me. Uh, they are a Southern Ontario tree. They're part of the Carolinian ecology. Uh, and they are mostly known for where I used to live in Indiana. They're also well known. There's called the Yellowwood Forest down in Indiana near Bloomington, uh, which is where I lived for uh, a short while. And they're also known for Pennsylvania, you know, Missouri, many parts of the eastern woodlands in the south, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. They're great examples. They grow all along Appalachia. But they also grow here. There's a native stand of tulip tree, also known as tulip poplar, yellow poplar, on the southwest shore of Rice Lake in the Lori Lawson Outdoor Ed Center. They are a native stand of tulip poplar, tulip tree that have been here for a long time. And so having these trees on the landscape, one of their other names is canoe wood or canoe tree because they were an easy wood to shape into dugout canoes. Their bark was used for making baskets, bags. The larger trees were used to make into uh, lodge coverings or shingles for roofs. Their flowers are beloved by butterflies and many of our other native pollinators. They're also used by honeybees. Eurasian and North American species of honeybees depend on the nectar of this tree and they have big, beautiful flowers all of them. Like you cannot describe a prettier tree in my opinion. They're also one of the largest deciduous trees in North America, if not the biggest. The only trees that we know that get bigger in North America than this tree are the white pine, the loblolly pine, and the redwood. Asia Gondok, the eastern white cedar. This is an eastern white cedar that I used for a lot of different things over the years. This tree was a tree stand for a while for hunting and then later became part of a components of a canoe and many other projects. Uh, this is actually a photo that Rachel Zilstra from uh, Twilt it got to experience with me. That's the Those markings on that white cedar are from a claws of a black bear that we bumped into <laughs> one day in these woods. Um, the Eastern White Cedar is one of the four sacred medicines of the Anishinaabek. It is also one of the most depended on trees by the Anishinaabek people. It is a beautiful tree that is resinous, strong for how light it is, flexible when exposed to heat or moisture or both. It is used for making birch bark canoe components, is used for making split cedar fans, the spiles for our sugar bush, even parts for our cradle boards to carry our babies. It is one of the most dependable trees there is in the woods if you know the rules of working with it. Matigwabok, the yellow bud hickory, also known as bitternut hickory, one of the strongest woods we have. It's one of the densest woods, one of the highest BTU or British thermal units of firewood we have in Ontario. Matigwabok is talking about in our language the tree we get bow wood from. So this is a hunting bow tree. This is where we get rope from. This is where we get shingles for lodges. And the even though they're called bitternut hickories, because they are very astringent and they are quite bitter, the oil of the yellow bud hickory nut is not bitter. In fact, it tastes like a pecan. And so it was a tree that we now believe may have been propagated in Ontario, including the, uh, the uh, Thousand Islands watershed region, by Indigenous people because it was one of the few large yield oil nuts that could grow in northern Ontario, uh, no, grow in the north. It's not just the trees in the forest. Jigaga wanch, which is the wild leek or ramp, I don't think I have to tell you much about the value of that plant. Uh, Ojibic, bloodroot, uh, sanguinaria canadensis, I believe is its full scientific name. It's a very, very potent medicine you don't want to mess around with too much, uh, except for explicit topical uses that are done by medicine people and homeopathic or naturopathic doctors that know what they're doing with it. But it's also used for making dyes because the name bloodroot is not joking. When you break one of those roots, it looks like it's bleeding. It looks like if you have a couple of drops on your fingertip, it looks like you cut yourself. Very, very beautiful flower. One of the early flowers of the woodlands in our region, especially in the sugar maple forests. Bibigwen, oh man, I really should have drank more coffee today. Bibig, which is cow parsnip, a uh, relative of the scary... This is a native plant, though. A lot of people try to eradicate cow parsnip because they think it's giant hogweed. It is not. This is a native plant. The stalk before the flower head opens into the humble flower that we recognize as the cow parsnip flower is actually edible. And the roots are used as very potent medicines by Anishinaabek people. Mashkigobog, 
a lot of people refer to the Labrador tea plant as a plant of the boreal forest, and they only go up north to gar gather it. This patch that's in that bundle in my hand was picked 30 minutes north of Peterborough. And I've seen it just north of the Thousand Island watershed region. It's a very common tea that is used for both a beverage just to enjoy, but also is considered one of our main medicines for influenza. This was a, pa a bundle I picked during the beginning of COVID so that I could take care of my family and keep us healthy and safe. And then we get into our roles and responsibilities as Indigenous people on this land, talking about the future of trees in Ontario. We have had a lot of diseases and a lot of negative impacts to our forests. We used to have, there used to be a, a, a saying that a gray squirrel could run from Quebec to Georgia and never touch the ground because of the amount of Eastern American chestnuts there were. Now they're pretty much extirpated effectively in most of Ontario. They're pretty much wiped out. One of our predominant trees is pretty much gone. Oak trees are under risk because of A, logging, B, habitat loss and devastation to the soil of the Carolinian forests, but also now diseases coming in to, ca to cause havoc. And so one of the roles we have as Anishinaabe people, as Indigenous people and as human beings, is to plant new trees. The tree on the left-hand side is an oak tree. I have over 150 oak seedlings currently growing in my in my house. And the photo on the right are American chestnuts. One of the most endangered trees we have. And those ones, look at those. I, uh, that's fo that photo is from this morning. Or sorry, yesterday morning. Those are rooting chestnuts. They all succeeded in germination and they're all going to get planted. And we're going to have chestnuts in my region again. Beyond that, we have other ecologies. We have the black oak savanna and tall grass prairie ecosystems of Ontario, uh, which are one of the most threatened ecosystems in Canada and in North America. Part of our relationship with the land has been managing the land. A lot of people think that the prairie ecosystems exist because of bison. Well, much of the black oak savanna and tall grass prairie ecosystems of Ontario didn't have bison. They had Haudenosaunee people, Anishinaabe people, Lenni Lenape people, and many other nations who burned the grass back. And this encourages cold weather grasses and certain plants like the picture on the right of a fireweed, Rose Bay Willow Herb fireweed, to thrive. And this leaves an open area that removes all the thatch, all the dead grasses and brush, these prescribed burns that have been done for thousands of generations. Uh, the man in the photograph is a good friend of mine who's an ecologist over at the Alderville Black Oak Savannah lighting a prescribed burn with a drip torch. And that is the result of drip torch prescribed burns. We have fireweed, we have native grasses all across that region. And now we're starting to implement prescribed burns in many other parts of Ontario to encourage this kind of habitat remaining. And that's the end of the rants. Uh, I took up a lot of time. <laughs> These are some photos of hickories and oak species and being out on the landscape. Uh, the photo on the top right is Wike American Calamus, or uh, sorry, Acorus Americanus, which is the native sweet flag, which is very heavily threatened by the invasive Calamus, Acorus Calamus, the Eurasian sweet flag. Uh, that's us growing in a little nursery garden at my homestead. The bottom right photo is us planting catalpas, cucumber trees, and butternuts back on the landscape here in Hiawatha. We've planted over 700 trees in the last three years alone with our own finances, with our own propagation projects not purchasing seeds from elsewhere or importing or anything like that, or doing big fundraisers. We've just been planting them ourselves. And that's kind of the, the last thing I want to talk about is the, tree, the forest of, of the future. We will not have forests in the future if we don't step up and work. We are part of the ecology. If we try to go by the conservation method that John Muir espoused back in his day, we're going to lose a lot of our landscapes because this landscape evolved to have humans involved. we This landscape was terraformed by Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people and Lenni Lenape and Delaware, uh, all kinds of nations across the Eastern Seaboard, all the way to the Mississippi and beyond. These forests require our involvement. They require our relationship. And that's 
what I want to get at for the future is if you want to have forests, you need to get involved, whether that's with funding towards land trusts, helping establish lands to protect and take care of and not have developed, or going out and planting trees and planting plants and saving ecologies and making sure that we have biodiversity and genetic diversity for the future. Thanks for having me, folks. This is really great. Um, yeah, really appreciate everything you guys did to help put this all together. Thank you uh, to everybody who, who came out and joined us. Um, you went to Caleb for, for giving us his time and putting together a presentation and, uh, and just packing so much information into, um, into our, our short one hour slot. Um, mm -hmm. If you are interested in hearing and learning more from Caleb, uh, his website is canadianbushcraft.ca. Uh, definitely encourage you to go check that out. Uh, and if you're interested in more from the Land Trust, including more talks like this come the winter season and all of our in-person summer events that are going on at Thousand Islands Watershed, you can have a look at uh, twilt.ca, T-I-W-L-T dot C-A. Until then, thank you all again so much for coming, and we will see you in the next one. Thank you.